Hi, my name is Erin Zikos, and I'm going to be discussing an article supervised by Dr. Jeffrey Meyer on neuroinflammation in the brain during major depressive episodes secondary to major depressive disorder. Although there are many molecular phenotypes associated with major depressive disorder, there is evidence that inflammation may play a role in generating symptoms of a major depressive episode. Previous studies have shown that the induction of inflammation is associated with depressive symptoms in both humans and rodents. Major depressive disorder has also been known to be associated with an increase in peripheral markers of inflammation such as C-reactive protein, interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor alpha, and translocator protein. Translocator protein is a protein located on the outer mitochondrial membrane of microglia, and its expression is elevated when microglia are activated during neuroinflammation. Previous studies have provided evidence for the neuroinflammatory hypothesis of major depressive disorder, which proposes that chronic inflammation may contribute to serotonergic, noradrenergic, and dopaminergic dysfunction. However, there has consistently been a lack of evidence for brain inflammation during major depressive episodes secondary to major depression. This study aimed to fill this gap in knowledge in the hopes of furthering the development of treatment for major depressive disorder and major depressive episodes. The main hypothesis of this study was that translocator protein would be elevated in the prefrontal cortex, anterior cingulate cortex, and insula of the major depressive episode patients relative to the controls. These regions have been known to be involved in major depressive disorder. Specifically, the prefrontal cortex and anterior cingulate cortex play a role in mood regulation and affect dysregulation, and the insula plays a role in immune activation and homeostatic regulation in depression. The authors also hypothesized that there would be a positive correlation between depression symptom severity and the density of translocator protein in these brain regions. To test these hypotheses, this study enlisted 20 participants currently experiencing a major depressive episode secondary to early onset major depression, as well as 20 age-matched healthy participants. All major depressive episode participants were not taking medication at least six weeks prior to the study. Additionally, the major depressive episode participants were administered the 17-item Hamilton Depression Rating Scale twice throughout the study, and they needed a minimum score of 17 to be enrolled. The total score on this scale is strongly correlated to depression symptom severity in terms of low mood and anhedonia. Blood samples were also taken from all participants in order to measure peripheral inflammatory markers present in serum. In order to measure the distribution and density of translocator protein, This study made use of a relatively new technique involving fluorine 18 FEPPA PET radio tracers. This radio tracer is specific and has a high affinity for translocator protein. Its binding is also increased during neuroinflammation. A bolus was administered intravenously and 125 minutes later, PET scans were obtained using 3D HRRT brain tomography. This study also looked at the participants' translocator protein genes and analyzed their binding affinities for translocator protein radio tracers. High affinity binders and mixed affinity binders account for over 90% of the population of North America. However, one participant of the study was a low affinity binder and was therefore omitted from the statistical analyses of the data. Using ANOVA, results showed that translocator protein was significantly increased throughout the cortical and subcortical brain regions of the major depressive episode participants, including the areas specific to the main hypothesis of the study. Translocator protein was also found to be further elevated in high affinity binders than in mixed affinity binders, which likely was an artifact of the method used. The authors also provided evidence towards their second hypothesis by demonstrating that translocator protein levels in the anterior cingulate cortex were positively correlated to depression severity scores, which is consistent with the role of the anterior cingulate cortex in mood regulation. From these observations, the authors concluded that the elevated levels of translocator protein found in the major depressive episode patients was related to greater microglial activation and therefore increased neuroinflammation. They also suggested that the correlation seen between translocator protein in the anterior cingulate cortex and depression severity score could have been caused indirectly, but they tend to favor a causal mechanism since the anterior cingulate cortex is involved in regulating and processing the negative emotional response. Major depressive episode symptoms have also been found to be associated with higher metabolic function in the anterior cingulate cortex, and direct stimulation of the subgenual anterior cingulate cortex can result in reduction of major depressive episode symptoms. 
The authors also noted that when activated, microglial cells phagocytose pathogens and dying cells and recruit immune cells. So they suggest that activation of microglia during a major depressive episode may represent a maladaptive response. Additionally, there was no significant correlation between neuroinflammation as depicted by translocator protein levels and peripheral inflammatory markers in serum. The authors proposed that this finding could demonstrate that central inflammation acts in isolation from peripheral inflammation during major depressive episodes. This was the first study to provide compelling evidence of neuroinflammation via microglial activation in major depressive episode patients unbiased by medication or other psychiatric illnesses. This provides evidence towards the neuroinflammatory hypothesis of major depressive disorder and may be important in identifying mechanisms that contribute to depression symptom severity or cause major depressive episodes. These findings provide a promising outlook on future therapeutic treatments of major depressive disorder and major depressive episodes, should they be correct. And they do seem to be in accordance with most previous studies, which found increases in other neuroinflammatory markers such as tumor necrosis factor alpha in some brain regions of people with major depression. A prior study by Steiner et al. reported increased microglial activation in the anterior cingulate cortex of major depressive episode patients. However, several studies, such as those done by Dean et al. and Shelton et al., are opposed, citing that they did not observe inflammatory responses in the anterior cingulate cortex or prefrontal cortex, respectively. A study by Van Otterloo et al. also reported no increase in microglial activation in the prefrontal cortex of major depressive disorder patients. In this study, there was a lack of correlation between central and peripheral inflammatory markers, which agrees with some published literature, but also disagrees with a proposed hypothesis that suggests in severe illness, peripheral cytokines can cross the blood-brain barrier to induce neuroinflammation and depressive symptoms. So it's not entirely clear where this study fits into the existing body of knowledge in this field. Especially if you take into account the caveats of the study. The radio tracer PET technique that was used to measure translocator protein distribution and density was not specific to cell type. Therefore, the authors cannot be certain that the activity measured was that involved in microglial activation since translocator protein has other roles in the brain that are not directly related to neuroinflammation. It's also possible that the translocator protein was not reflective of microglial cells but instead of astrocytes, and it wouldn't be possible to tell in this study, as the resolution of the scanner did not allow for cell type identification. That means that it's possible that translocator protein may not reflect microglial activation and neuroinflammation, but it may still be involved in major depressive disorder, as it was globally increased in the brains of major depressive episode patients. The role of translocator protein needs to be further explored. Additionally, a future study could be done that involves specific spatial induction of microglial cells in brain regions such as the anterior cingulate cortex and insula. This would further our understanding of their roles in depressive behavior. If we assume that the findings of the study can be solely applied to microglial cells, then there is a potential for developing therapeutic strategies involving the reduction or inhibition of microglial activation in order to treat major depressive disorder and major depressive episodes. Such a study has already been attempted in rodents using the antibiotic minocycline and showed promising results. I look forward to hearing about future research regarding this topic. Thank you for listening, and a special thanks to Dr. William Ju for providing me with this platform to share this study supervised by Dr. Jeffrey Meyer. Hi, my name is Mila Valchich. I'm a fourth year student at the University of Toronto, currently enrolled in the HMB 420 course, in which I will be presenting an interesting paper on social cognition changes in neurodegenerative diseases and how these changes are linked to altered brain activity. The paper I will be discussing is cited here at the bottom. I had the honor of interviewing the principal investigator on this paper, Dr. Carmela Tartaglia, and I look forward to discussing this paper in more detail for you all. I'd like to begin with a brief overview on the topic of neurodegenerative diseases and past research and why it is important to be doing this kind of research. Well, what are neurodegenerative diseases? Neurodegeneration refers to the progressive loss of neurons in the central nervous system and is a leading cause of cognitive and motor dysfunction. There are several different neurodegenerative diseases but this paper focuses on frontotemporal dementia, Alzheimer's disease, and Parkinson's disease. 
All of these diseases have some unique and some shared symptoms, and the major focus when researching these diseases typically tends to examine the cognitive domains of memory, language, and other functions. But this paper wants to tackle a domain that has shown to be impacted with growing research, and that is the social cognition deficits seen in neurodegenerative diseases. Social cognition refers to processes such as perception and recognition of emotional signals, processing information about beliefs and intentions, and many other processes that in general allow an individual to engage in social interactions. Frontotemporal dementia can be broken up into three clinical terms, but social cognition deficits tend to be early signs of what is known as behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia, such as dramatic personality and behavioral changes with apathy and inability to interpret others' emotions. There's also growing research that indicates individuals with Alzheimer's disease have a decreased ability to recognize emotions, and Parkinson's disease individuals have trouble recognizing facial expressions of emotion, among other social cognition deficits. Past research has addressed changes in brain activity that seem to be linked to these social cognition deficits, such as what is known as the default mode network. This is a prime target in Alzheimer's disease specifically, and it includes many brain regions, such as the medial prefrontal cortex, the inferior temporal cortex, nucleus accumbens, the midbrain, and many others. Overall, this network is believed to be responsible for a baseline state of the brain that represents social cognitive functions like self-reference and emotional processing. Another network that has been linked to neurodegenerative diseases and causing social cognitive deficits is dysfunction to the saliency network. This plays a role in directing attention to relevant salient information in one's environment. Individuals with behavioral variant frontotemporal dementia show increased connectivity of the default mode network and a dysfunctional saliency network, but individuals with Alzheimer's disease show the opposite pattern. Individuals with Parkinson's disease have shown less reliable findings. Some studies show that there's no changes to, for example, the default mode network, and some studies show that there are significant changes. So this is less understood in that sense. But in general, past studies have shown that there are these network-wide alterations in these neurodegenerative diseases. However, it remained uncertain if social cognition relevant regions in specific have altered functional activation. In addition, the researchers of this paper believed identifying alterations in these large-scale networks could potentially be masking changes that are occurring in region-to-region -region functional connectivity. So, what I mean by that is the connections between two specific social cognition relevant regions. And that was the purpose of this study, to examine changes in region of interest to region of interest functional connectivity and functional activity of individual regions and its overall association with social cognition function in neurodegenerative diseases. I will discuss the methods and materials of this study. Participants consisted of 18 individuals with Alzheimer's disease, 19 with Parkinson's disease, 10 with frontotemporal dementia, and 10 healthy controls. And the individuals with neurodegenerative diseases had their caregivers participate as well in tests that assessed social cognition function of the patients. Here's a general overview of the procedure that I will go into more detail for, but Basically, they began with a bunch of tests and questionnaires that assessed different aspects of social cognition. Then they did functional magnetic resonance imaging, as well as diffusion tensor imaging. Here are all of the tests and questionnaires that the participants completed. The CDR was used to interview the caregivers in order to assess the severity of dementia in the patients. The TACIT EET assesses patients' ability to recognize emotions. The IRI measures the cognitive and emotional aspects of empathy, which includes things like perspective taking. And there was a social norms questionnaire. Then they did fMRI. They started with an exploratory voxel-to-voxel -voxel analysis to find any differences in bold activation of brain regions between the four groups of individuals. Then they extracted regions of interest to use for ROI to voxel connectivity analysis, which was the next step. And finally, they did statistical analyses of the ROI to voxel results 
with these social cognition measures to find any possible correlations. This ROI to ROI functional connectivity analysis can be used in combination with DTI, which is a structural analysis, to understand whether the observed behavior or symptom is associated with functional or structural dysfunction between two brain regions. They did DTI analysis of the uncinate fasciculus because it structurally connects the frontal pole and the inferior temporal gyrus of the brain. So they wanted to see if this was mediating the functional connectivity between these two regions. The results of the voxel to voxel analysis identified five regions of interest in which bold signal was different among the four groups. The left inferior temporal gyrus seen here, the right central opercular cortex, the right supramarginal gyrus and right angular gyrus, and the right inferior temporal gyrus. Then they used these ROIs and did ROI to voxel analysis to determine if the connectivity was altered between these ROIs and other areas in the brain. Healthy controls are these stripe lines and bars that go above zero mean that there is a positive connectivity between the ROI on the y-axis and the brain region on the x-axis. And bars below zero are negative connectivity. This analysis revealed a lot of interesting alterations, as can be seen in this graph, because many of these bars do not look like the bars of the healthy controls. But the researchers decided to only examine regions relevant to social cognition. So that gives us these results from the ROI to voxel analysis. The same ROIs remain here in bold, and the brain regions that showed significant altered connectivity with the ROIs are seen in italics, and these are all areas in the brain that are relevant to social cognition. Shown on the screen are all of the results for this, but I have started these two because then they looked at significant correlations between the ROI to voxel results with the results of the tests and questionnaires done at the beginning, and they found that these two had altered functional connectivity that was correlated to some of the social cognition tests. The left inferior temporal gyrus with the bilateral frontal pole and parasingulate gyrus, the results of this functional connectivity was positively associated with the IRIPT, which is the score for perspective taking, the social norms questionnaire, and the awareness of social inference test emotion evaluation test, as well as the right supramarginal gyrus and the right angular gyrus with the right frontal pole showed a positive correlation with the IRIEC, which is the score for empathic concern, the score for perspective taking as well, the revised self-monitoring scale for the sensitivity to the expressive behavior of others, and the revised self-monitoring scale for the score that looks at the ability to modify self-presentation. And they found a trend for tacit EET as well. As I mentioned previously, DTI analysis was done because the inferior temporal gyrus is structurally connected to the frontal pole by the uncinate fasciculus. So the researchers wanted to determine if the uncinate fasciculus was playing a mediating role in the altered functional connectivity between these two regions that we saw in the results. The results showed no significant mediating effect of the uncinate fasciculus on the functional connectivity between the right inferior temporal gyrus and the frontal pole, and they found a very low effect between the left inferior temporal gyrus and frontal pole, which is too low to on its own cause the functional connectivity changes that were observed. So to conclude and wrap this all up and explain what these results mean, here are the main takeaways from the results of the paper. There were five ROIs that showed different bold signal activation between the neurodegenerative groups and the healthy controls. These ROIs had altered functional connectivity with several other brain regions, importantly, with some social cognition relevant brain regions. And some of these connections were correlated with tests or questionnaires that assessed social cognition. All three of the neurodegenerative disease groups had significantly lower scores on perspective taking compared to the healthy control group. And individuals with frontotemporal dementia had worse scores for the social norms questionnaire compared to healthy controls. 
So this is all very interesting because this study seems to show significant correlations between alterations in the brain and specific social cognitive deficits that are seen in patients with neurodegenerative diseases. So what are the implications of this study? What can we learn from these results and how can they be used to improve patient care? The results of this study showed support for the idea that social cognition is impacted in these neurodegenerative diseases, such as the ability to recognize emotions, perspective taking, which represents cognitive empathy, and many others. The ability to recognize emotions in another individual is a key element in maintaining interpersonal relationships, and studies have shown it's an important factor for mental health, such that a lack of ability to recognize emotions in adults has been associated with overall mental health problems and communication problems. The study I presented concludes with speaking about how altered social cognition ability in neurodegenerative disease patients is associated with caregiver burden and depression, particularly when it's unrecognized as a symptom. When I spoke to Dr. Tartaglia, she brought up how social cognition changes tend to be very early symptoms in neurodegenerative diseases, which is consistent with findings from other studies, where individuals present with these deficits before being diagnosed with the disease. And sometimes these individuals will instead end up in psychiatry mistakenly. So the findings of this study show good reason to use resting state fMRI as an early biomarker for neurodegenerative diseases. And I also think if the patient has been diagnosed already, it could help identify potential social cognitive deficits that they will display, or if they already are showing deficits, it can provide a neural explanation for why that's happening. So this can be identified early on, which I believe is very important because it could be used to educate doctors for diagnosing, the caregivers, and the general population. It's because people tend to associate neurodegenerative diseases with things like memory loss or motor movement impairments. So when they get diagnosed, it's in the later stages when these symptoms occur. But knowing that social cognition tends to be an early deficit and quite an impactful one, it could possibly allow for earlier diagnosis, which could also possibly help with treatment plans. In terms of further studies, when I spoke to Dr. Tartaglia, she spoke to me about another one of her studies that show that when caregivers are asked to estimate how well the patient is at detecting emotion, the caregivers tend to overestimate and that this inaccuracy was related to their caregiver burden and depression. So it is very important, as she mentioned and as her papers mentioned, to educate people. Hopefully through educating caregivers, they can understand just how much of an impairment patients have to their social cognition abilities and could decrease caregiver burden. And this could be studied more in depth in the future. Overall, I found this study extremely interesting and I learned a lot in terms of social cognition deficits that are seen in neurodegenerative disease patients and how much functional activation and connectivity to other brain regions is correlated to very specific social cognitive deficits. Having the incredible opportunity to interview Dr. Tartaglia allowed me to see the impact this study could have on patient outcome and their caregivers. And I look forward to staying up to date with these new studies that come out in the future around this topic. Thank you so much for listening. Here are my references. Hello, my name is Sebastian Worma. I am an undergraduate student at the University of Toronto in the Department of Human Biology. Today, I will be presenting a review of the paper Prebiotic intake reduces the waking cortisol response and alters emotional bias in healthy volunteers. This paper focuses on what is known as the gut-brain axis. Now this has become an incredibly important area of research just over the past few years, with studies showing that changes in your gut and your microbiome affecting diseases in the brain, but diseases in the rest of the body as well, such as cancers and autoimmune diseases. Now this study specifically looked at how changes in the microbiota in your gut affect cortisol levels, emotional cognition and processing, and the HPA axis in your brain. To induce changes in the microbiota, these researchers used prebiotics. Now prebiotics are different than 
what is commonly known as probiotics. Probiotics are food supplements that actually contain the live strains of beneficial bacteria in them. Prebiotics are food supplements which, when ingested, are apt as food for the microbiota in your gut. And these food supplements are fermented and broken down into their metabolites, such as short-chain fatty acids. Now, many common species of beneficial bacteria, such as bifidobacterium and lactobacilli, can break down these prebiotics into metabolites such as short-chain short -chain fatty acids. The two prebiotics used in this study are fructooligosaccharides, BOS, and bimunogalactooligosaccharides, BGOS. In the brain, this research examined what is known as the cortisol awakening response. Now, this is a natural part of your body's circadian rhythm. It is the increase in cortisol released from the HPA axis, which you can see here on the right, within the first 30 to 45 minutes after waking up. However, in chronic stress and anxiety conditions, there is elevated cortisol, an elevated cortisol awakening response because the HPA axis is dysregulated. Now, the basis of this research comes from animal studies that have showed that germ-free mice have elevated corticosterone levels. And in this study, in order to measure the levels of cortisol, the researchers used salivary measurements. And these are regarded as the gold standard for testing cortisol as a biomarker, for testing the biomarker cortisol. And they're highly indicative of HPA activity. So it was hypothesized that by administering and ingesting prebiotics, you could actually induce anxiolytic changes, neuromodulation, and changes in the HPA axis. Now this was particularly relevant because this is the first study of its kind to look at how the ingestion of these prebiotics can act as neuromodulators, specifically inducing anxiolytic changes in humans. Participants were split into three groups, the control group, test group one given FOSS, and test group two given BGOS. Salivary cortisol was measured at day zero and day 21. And additionally, emotional processing and cognition tests were given at day zero and day 21 as well. So what were the results? Well, with the administration of BGOS, there was a significant reduction in cortisol levels in the cortisol awakening response. However, there was no significant change with the administration of FOSS. Now you can see this in the two graphs below. The graph on the right is simply an area under the curve of each of these charts on the left. Now you can see there's a significant difference between the placebo on day 21 and BGOS group on day 21. And additionally, there's a significant difference within the BGOS group from day zero and day 21. So again, what this says is that the ingestion of this prebiotic, the oligosaccharide, actually resulted in lower cortisol levels being measured. So what were the subjective results from the emotional processing and cognition assessments? Well, of the five tests given, only one yield, yielded the um, significant results. And this was the attentional vigilance to negative and positive words in the dot probe task. I said, essentially measuring participants' reaction to negative and positive stimuli. Now, if you take a look at the chart B down here, we can see that there was a significant change in the unmasked dot probe task between BGOS and placebo with an increased attentional vigilance to positive words. And chart A here, this is the mask task, there was no significant difference. So what were the conclusions from this research? Well, we saw that the administration of the prebiotic BGOS yielded a significant reduction in salivary cortisol awakening response in humans. Simultaneously, there was also behavioral changes. There were changes in emotional processing and cognition on one of, one of those tests administered. Now this does suggest that changes in your microbiota can affect changes in the HPA axis in the brain. This paper 
was conducted by a leading group of researchers at the University of Oxford in the United Kingdom, led by Dr. Philip Burnett. I actually had the chance to speak with Dr. Burnett about this research. And over the next two slides, I've included excerpts from our conversation, which I think are particularly interesting and relevant to this discussion. The first question I asked Dr. Burnett was why he chose to focus on cortisol and the HPA axis. Um, again, to provide the proof of principle that it might be anxiolytic as shown in the animals, uh, we went for the HPA axis. So, so the animal work, the whole, the whole thing is based in a, on a 2004 paper by Sudo and colleagues who showed that uh, germ-free mice had an exaggerated HPA axis response when they were uh, um, stressed. So, so the initial connection with the microbiome was the HPA axis. Mm -hmm. So as well as emotional processing, um, we chose to look at salivary cortisol, firstly because of the connection with the HPA axis, um, but secondly it was easy to access. We didn't have to, you know, stress anyone by taking blood or, you know, we decided against that. So we wanted to leave the participants alone as much as possible and they collected their saliva at home and all they did was a test when that when they came in after the three weeks uh, but also there is data showing that antidepressants lowered the cortisol peak um so we you know so we would be consistent with that so it's a measure that has sort of been validated um, for an antidepressant drug we wouldn't see that had comparable effects now this is this is really interesting because it it shows how this research both built off those incredible animal studies where the germ-free mice had increased corticosterone levels, but also it shows and the data show in this research that the administration of these prebiotics have similar effects to the administration of antidepressant drugs, and that opens this research up to a whole field of future possibilities for their use in mood disorders and as neuromodulators. Now, if you remember back in the results, BGOS induced significant changes, but not FOSS. Now I asked Dr. Burnett why he thought that only one of these prebiotics induced significant changes, while the other did not. The question is something that, that you know, we've been wondering about. The obvious thing was that perhaps the dose wasn't enough for the fructooligosaccharides. Now, um, the, the, we wanted it to be uh, comparable to the BGOS, the fructooligosaccharides, but on the actual, uh, the, the instructions for the fructooligosaccharides was twice as much. Now, when we first started a pilot study with twice as much, it was uncomfortable. A lot of people got quite distension. So we thought rather than sacrifice, you know, lots of, having a lot of dropouts in that group, Let's lower this. So it might be that that's why it's so high. To, you know, ten grams as opposed to three grams of the vehicle, because because it doesn't have an effect even on the gut bacteria. Um, but it also might be that um, BGOS is, in terms of mechanism, BGOS is so much better at growing bifidobacteria and FOS. FOS does grow some bifidobacteria, some lactobacilli, but bifidobacteria, you know, grow, grow several fold more of lactooligosaccharides. So the, you can argue for, for us, I think the limitation, it, it would have been, it may have been the dose, but if we used the recommended dose, I think we would have had a lot of dropout because initial studies show that, that there was discomfort or um, the possibility of a mechanistic route that the BGOS just produce more bifidobacteria. Now that's a really interesting hypothesis and it's been proven as we'll talk about later um, with this BGOS indu induced growth in bifidobacteria and it shows the changes in these bacteria levels but then I asked what the next steps would be to sort of solve this puzzle of getting from the changes in the bacteria to the brain and looking at potentially some next studies to further elucidate this mechanism. When any oligosaccharide is, is fermented by the bacteria, they do produce a lot of acetate. And mm -hmm. we've 
I don't know if you looked at other other of our papers, but we we looked into the role of acetate uh, with one parameter of uh, in mice, so in rats. Um, so we so we found that um, in a study we published last year um, that when you give this galacto oligosaccharide, um, it caused epigenetic changes um, in the brain and it reduced antipsychotic induced weight gain. So there's some me metabolic effects and epigenetic effects in the brain. Now, when we gave acetate to the animals, so that they are so the blood levels were comparable to those produced by a prebiotic, we didn't find the same changes, which ruled out acetate. Um, now, it doesn't mean to say acetate doesn't, it, it travels directly to the brain, and certainly it's been associated with the glutamate receptors we're looking at. Um, so it, it might be, it still has, a, has an effect, but it also needs something else to, to, to act with it, for example, butyric acid having an effect on the gut, which then may um, um, transmit to the brain. And so as, as Dr. Burnett mentioned there, um, further studies were actually conducted on one of these short chain fatty acids, acetate, um, and Dr. Burnett actually conduct, led this study. However, they were not able to identify acetate as the um, significant um, molecule in, in sort of connecting these two systems. But acetate is only one of the three short chain fatty acids produced, also butyrate and propionate. And so this really, there is a, a multitude of future implications um, from which we can study both, as you mentioned, how these, these short chain fatty acids travel to the brain, but also what they do when they get there. Lastly, I wanted to ask Dr. Burnett what he would change about his experiment if he were to conduct it today. And this is what he had to say about that. To be honest, I, I think I would go for longer. I think I would double the time. Um, and well, today we have an advantage because there may be an emotional processing test that we can repeat now. But if we were limited to the same equipment as we were, um, when we first did it in 2015, yeah. um, I, I think I would double the time. I still, I'm not sure about the doubling the dose of, of the fox, but possibly we could double, you know, double the dose of the, of the fox and just recruit more people, hoping that, you know, we don't get a large dropout number. Um, and, and certainly get some more cognitive tests in. Because of the, one test we found a change in the emotional processing um, suggested it was emotional cognition that was um, that was changed. So after further analysis on this field and conducting my interview with Dr. Burnett, I was able to review this paper and identify and both um, essentially prove with current research that this BGOS, galacto-oligosaccharide, has shown strong increases uh, in, has shown to induce strong increases in the levels of bifidobacterium in, in your microbiota. Now, future studies need to elaborate on why GOS is more effective than FOS, specifically what are the differences between these two oligosaccharides, and what are the changes they induce in your gut. Additionally, as briefly mentioned there, there was a follow-up study using um, examining one of the short-chain fatty acids, acetate. However, um, more studies need to be done to specifically examine how increasing the levels of these bacteria in the gut correspond to the changes in the short-chain fatty acid concentrations. And additionally, how these short-chain fatty acids both travel to the brain and when they get to the brain, what do they interact with there? So identifying, once again, the specific mechanism of action. But this study did prove and show potential anxiolytic downstream effects when participants are administered prebiotics, specifically BGOS, and this is mediated by the gut microbiome. And this allows for future research to, in fact, take a look and aim to and elucidate this mechanism connecting the gut and the brain. 
So what are some future studies that can take this research and help to identify the mechanism connecting these two? Well, recent research has actually identified a species of bacteria, Lactobacilli rhamnosus. This is an incredibly interesting species, which has been shown to travel and, or to communicate from the gut to the brain via the vagus nerve, and has actually shown to modulate anxiety in the brain. Now, this would be a really interesting species of bacteria to conduct specific studies on, on how the prebiotic administration influences the concentrations of these bacteria. And this would allow for a next step in that mechanism to be solved. Lastly, as Dr. Burnett mentioned, additional time, extended time and dosage studies would be necessary. The extended time would allow for a more thorough analysis of the behavioral changes. So we saw the changes in emotional processing and cognition in one of the studies, but extended, extended time would allow for a deeper analysis of this. Additionally, increasing the dose of FOSS may increase the chance and may increase its effectiveness of producing and eliciting significant neurological changes. Thank you for taking the time to listen to my presentation today. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Lulian Zhen, and uh, this is my journal club presentation. I will give you a background of the article. I will talk about the methods used in the article and the results obtained from the lab. And I, I will analyze the strengths and limitations of the study. The title of the article is The Sublateral Dorsal Tegmental Nucleus Functions to Couple Brain State and Model Activity During REM Sleep and Wakefulness. And it was published on Current Biology in 2019. Here are some information and background of the article. First, what is REM sleep? REM sleep is a rapid eye movement sleep. It is a unique stage of a sleep. At this stage, the brain is active, but the muscle is immobilized. Often have dreams, and also with random or rapid movement of eyes. Second, where is the sublateral dorsal tegmental nucleus? Um, it is in the dorsal pons, and uh, from previous studies, we know SLD plays a central role in inducing model suppression during REM sleep. And next, what is a cataplexy? So cataplexy is a sudden and uh, uncontrollable muscle paralysis during wakefulness. During with fullness, we need some levels of muscle tone to support our daily activity, such as sitting and standing. However, as the author said, it is unclear how the brain functions to couple brain muscle tone with waking behaviors. Therefore, the authors designed this experiment to identify the circuit mechanisms that couple muscle tone and waking behaviors. In sleep biology, there is a hypothesis that cataplexy is caused by recruitment of the brainstem circuits that induce muscle paralysis during REM sleep. This experiment used behavioral, electrophysiological, and chemogenetic strategies to test this hypothesis in mass. And also, the author tried to determine if SLD cells are capable to decouple brain state and model activity during wakefulness in cataplexy. Now look at the methods that the authors used in the article. The goal of this experiment is to determine how chemogenetic manipulation of SLD cell activity affects muscle paralysis during cataplexy. This experiment used animal models and they used 13 male arctic knockout mass and 12 male well tap mass. The experiment used drugs which are mutated muscarinic G protein coupled receptors. HM3DQ are excitatory receptors and HM4D are inhibitory receptors. And these receptors are activated by clozapine and oxide, which are produce behavioral effects. Drugs are designer receptors exclusively activated by designer drugs. 
it permits rapid and reversible manipulation of neuronal activity. The lab uses viral vectors to introduce drugs into SLD neurons. And the, the viral construct, adeno-associated virus, harboring HM3DQ or HM4D I receptors. The chemogenetic receptor also used either M-cherry or GFP as fluorescent reporter. After recovering for 14 days up from the viral injection surgery, the mass were give, given the second surgery for the implantation of the for EEG and EMG electrodes. The electrocephalography EEG is a brain imaging technique that used to distinguish different arousal states, for example, awake, REM sleep, and, uh, and non-REM sleep. The EMG is a technique that you really use to record the electrical activity produced by skeletal muscles. In this experiment, the muscle activity were recorded in both the right neck muscle and the right masseter muscle. Um, now to discuss the results the authors obtained. First, they found out that silencing SLD neurons prevents model Antonia during REM sleep. First, they tried to find out the functional role of SLD cells in REM sleep. They used chemogenetic strategies to silence SLD neurons, and at the same time, they monitored the brain state and motor activity in all of same mice. They targeted SLD cells with HM4DI receptors, and they record cortical EEG and EMG activity. Take a look at the graph B. The left part of the graph B clearly shows that the CNO induced silencing of HM4DI expressing SLD cells increased model activity during REM sleep. And the group data on the right part shows that compared to controls, silencing of HM4DI expressing SLD neurons prevents REM sleep, atonia by increasing model activity during REM sleep. The graph D and the graph E shows that silencing SLD neurons had no effect on, on the levels of model activity during either wakefulness or non-REM sleep. As we know, the adeno-associated virus harboring HM4D I receptors. In order to verify that neither AAV mediated protein expression nor CNO administration were responsible for increased muscle activity during REM sleep, the authors drop expression of M cherry in SLD cells and gave mice CNO. M cherry is a basic red fluorescent protein. According to graph F, we could cl clearly say that neither AAV mediate protein expression nor CNO administration were responsible to alter the levels of muscle activity during REM sleep. Therefore, the first result of the study is that silencing SLD neurons prevents motor atonia during REM sleep. Secondly, they, find, they found out that activation of SLD cells promotes cataplexy in ARCs and mice. In order to determine the, the relationship of SLD cells and the muscle tone, they activated the HM3DQ expressing SLD cells in ARCs and mice. Pairing the graph D with graph C, we could cl clearly say that Activation of SLD neurons triggered an increase in the number of cataplexy attacks that oryxin mice experience. The other hand is also designed another lab to show that silencing SLD cells prevents cataplexy in oryxin mice. A pie chart of graph A and graph B on the right side of the page shows that silencing SLD neurons had no effect on amounts of REM sleep, but decreased amounts of awakefulness and the increase the, the amount of non-REM sleep. And the pie chart of graph B also shows that silencing SLD cells decrease the number of cataplexy episodes in oryxin mice.
the most important result of the study is that they found out that SLD neurons can decouple hormonal activity and arousal state in healthy mice. Graph B shows the cortical activity of the wild-type mice. After CNO administration, these wild-type mice began to experience repeated cataplexy-like attacks. They are unable to move. They are in a prone position on the cage floor. And uh, comparing the graph C and graph D, we could c clearly see that SLD activation induces multiple cataplexy episodes in a wild-type mouse. From graph H, we can see the EMG pattern of both cataplexy in oxy mice and uh, the SLD activation in wild-type mice are very similar. They were always preceded and followed by periods of active wakefulness. This pattern is different from the pattern of the REM sleep. And from graph I, they found out that the power distribution of cortical EEG activity is highly similar during both SLD activation in wild-type mice and also cataplexy in, in RX mice. But it is different from the EEG activity during REM sleep. All these behavioral observations and electrophysiological data suggest that SLD activation induces a brain and motor state that mimics cataplexy, which, in other words, SLD activation decouples brain state and motor activity during wakefulness in health conditions. This result is very important because it suggests that the pathological recruitment of SLD could underlie cataplexy in narcolepsy. In conclusion, the authors' results agreed with several previous studies that SLD plays a central role in arousal model synchrony during REM sleep. In addition, they found out that SLD is capable to trigger model suppression during wakefulness in both health and the disease conditions. Therefore, they proposed that pathological recruitment of SLD neurons could underlie cataplexy in narcolepsy. They also suggest that Loss of SLD neurons causes model activation during REM sleep in REM sleep behavior disorder. Last, the strength of the study. So the results are, are biologically important and clinically relevant because part of the results agrees with, with previous studies that the SLD functions to induce model suppression during natural REM sleep. And the other part of this result is completely new because it shows that SLD is able to be the couple brain state and the monotone during wakefulness. In all, the study supports the long-standing hypothesis in the sleep biology. However, the study does not provide too much information about, about the process of the experiment.